October 2013 marked one year since St. Lucian's began paying the value-added tax, VAT, on several goods and services. In the first few months of the implementation of the tax, there was much public debate on the process which experienced a number of teething problems. A number of issues arose in the initial stages, including the rate at which the hospitality industry would charge VAT, as well as one of the most critical concerns, VAT on medicines. Today, the tax system still raises a number of questions including its effectiveness to increase government's revenue while allowing businesses to stay afloat amidst a serious downturn in the economy. There's also been an increase over the last 16 months in both the number of job losses and businesses closing down. And while that alone is not to be blamed, a number of employers, particularly in the retail sector, are reporting the negative adverse effects of VAT on not only business, but the health sector today. Prior to the implementation of VAT, the Customs Department used an internationally recognized system called Harmonized Commodity Description and Coding System 1996 Revision or HS96 to classify goods entering the country. By entering keywords or HS code, you can search list of products and commodities with their six-digit, four-digit, or two-digit HS codes at the online database. Take, for instance, a very commonly used antibiotic called ampicillin. Under the HS96 system, the import duty was calculated at 10%, consumption tax at 5%, and service charge at 5%, adding up to a total of 20%. Since the implementation of VAT, a new system, the HS2007 revised system was adopted. Under this system, the same drug, ampicillin, is now calculated as follows. Import duty, 15%. VAT, 15%. And service charge, 5%. Adding up to a total of 35%. An increase of 15%. The actual formula for calculating the total consumption tax and percentage duties where the cost, insurance and freight, CIF, is EC $100 would be as follows. 100 plus the import duty of 10%, which is then multiplied by a consumption tax of 5%. This would be total to 5.5%. The total percentage duty would then be calculated by adding the import duty of 10% to the consumption tax of 5.5% plus the service charge of 5% to give a total of 20.5%. Pharmacy A would have paid 20.5% of EC $100, which amounts to EC $31.50 under the old tax system. However, under the new tax system, the HS2007 with VAT, the import duty is now 15%, plus the CIF, plus the service charge, which remained the same. The total would then be multiplied by 15% VAT. So the total VAT would be 100 plus 15 plus 5, and then multiplied by 15% to give a total of 18%. The total duty would then be calculated by adding the import duty of 15% to the total VAT of 18% and the service charge of 5%, which equals to 38%. Pharmacy A, under the new tax system, is now paying EC $38 on this consignment, a total increase of 17.5% from the previous tax system. Under the old tax system, EC $100 worth of cough and cold medicines would have required Pharmacy A to pay a total tax amount of EC $26, largely due to a difference in the consumption tax of 10%, compared to 5% for ampicillin. However, under the new tax system, Pharmacy A is now paying EC $38 on this consignment, a total increase of 12%. These and many more examples prove that the government of St. Lucia has misrepresented the facts on VAT on medication. The figures quoted earlier provide a true reflection of how taxes are computed and can be further verified with officials at the Customs Department. It is quite clear that the introduction of the new harmonized system together with the implementation of VAT 
has seen a drastic increase in the tariff rates of medication, with about 10% remaining unchanged. Further, there seems to be no evidence to suggest that there is any reduction in tariffs for medication. Mindful of the cries of despair from a population reeling under the impact of the value-added tax, the St. Lucia Medical and Dental Association has persistently called for the removal of VAT on medication. In an interview with HTS News Force dated October 31, 2012, former president of the association, Dr. Lisa Charles says, pharmaceuticals cost more because of double taxation. According to Dr. Charles, this makes patient compliance with their prescription medication regimen more difficult. Patient compliance with medication, she says, is essential to the prevention and treatment of disease. She says increasing the cost of medications through the additional charge of VAT on goods already charged with consumption tax leads to patients being unable to afford them. And I understand that CARICOM removed um, the tax uh, so that we can now replace it with VAT, but I think it was, an, it was an, also an opportunity um, for the government in keeping with the whole concept of UHC and making um, medical care accessible for all to look at possibly reducing medication costs by not implementing the full 15% of VAT back onto medications. We actually had the option to reduce medication costs. So um, it, it's, it is not true, it's frankly not true that medications did not go up in cost, they did. Senior citizens have and will continue to be the ones most affected by the increases. With most confined to a fixed income and already having to deal with taxations on pensions and property, Expensive medication is one more reality they must confront. They're a vulnerable group, they're on a fixed income, and they're also a group within the population that is more susceptible to disease. As our bodies age, our bodies um, are more susceptible to diseases such as cancer, heart disease, etc. So this is exactly the group that you would expect to have to bear the, um, the, the highest um, costs in terms of medical care. Independent Senator and former Chief Medical Officer in the Ministry of Health, Dr. Stephen King, agrees with Dr. Charles and explains that the very first white paper which was produced in preparation for the implementation of VAT exempted pharmaceuticals from the new tax regime. When we were introducing the VAT um, regime this time around, um, there was a debate even prior to implementing the VAT. In fact, the first white paper that was produced on the VAT um, exempted pharmaceuticals from the VAT. And I'll come back to what I think is the wisdom of that. However, when we did actually pass the VAT um, bill, we, um, we, we, we had brought pharmaceuticals into the VAT regime, so pharmaceuticals were then VATed. At that time, we'd also, um, uh, the, government's, uh, the government decided that what they would do is reduce the CET so that the net effect would be minimal in terms of the actual retail price of medicines. The reason for the initial exemption, Dr. King stated, was to pave the way for the implementation of the universal health care policy. The whole idea of UHC, he says, is to make medication more affordable, more accessible, and more available to people. This, he added, was an opportunity lost when the government decided to charge VAT to pharmaceuticals. You may, you may remember, and it's still talked about, universal health care and universal health coverage, where what we are trying to do is make um, health services more affordable, more accessible, more available to people. Um, part of that is making pharmaceuticals uh, more affordable. And my position is that that's a, 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 an opportunity that we had with the VAT regime to actually, yes, remove the CET, but in addition to that, remove or not and put VAT on medicines. We could even select the medicines that we were not going to put the VAT on. And the rationale behind that really is that chronic diseases in particular, diabetes, hypertension, um, arthritis, um, glaucoma, um, cancer. These, these um, diseases um, de uh, have a demand on medication. Sometimes they're expensive and sometimes they're for lifelong. Cancer has a very ex 
Um, there are many expensive medications one has to use with, 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 with chemotherapy for cancer patients. And the 15% VAT is a significant sum of money that people in the public to pay. For things like hypertension, they're not very expensive, but it's over a lifetime, so it, it accumulates. So it does have an impact yeah, on, on, on people. And the cheaper, because the cheaper you can make it, the more people that will be able to afford. Medical practitioner and founder of Wellness Innovators, Dr. Andre Matthew says, he receives complaints from patients on a daily basis. Some who have been affected by chronic illnesses for more than a decade are no longer able to afford medication. Dr. Matthew says, it's depressing to see that there's not much that can be done for patients other than waiving their medical fees or providing discounts when they come in to see him. As much as medical doctors like Dr. Matthew would like to help patients, they would undeniably be outnumbered by a population of 160,000, eventually causing them to operate at a loss. This in turn would affect their financial commitments as well as their families. The real solution, he advises, is to spend money to help prevent diseases rather than cure it. With a country that has the most cases of diabetes per capita in the world, Dr. Matthew says the government has no choice but to equally spend to not only help prevent diseases, but to manage it. Okay, in, you know in the past, it used to be said that prevention is better than cure. You know, today most countries, most governments have learned that prevention is not only better than cure, but cheaper than cure. And, you know, when you think about prevention, it's important to understand the levels of prevention to really grasp that concept. So we talk about primary prevention, secondary and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention is where you prevent an illness from occurring altogether. So, for example, let's use diabetes mellitus as the condition that we use for this example here. In diabetes mellitus primary prevention, you're preventing a certain person from getting diabetes at all in their lifetime. So you tell them a lot about lifestyle changes and, and the like. In secondary uh, prevention of diabetes mellitus, you're trying to detect the diabetes mellitus in that individual before they even recognize the symptoms or signs of diabetes mellitus. So for example, even before they start saying that they're thirsty or they're urinating frequently or that they're using, losing weight, the aim would have been to find that diabetes you know, before that. Okay, so to find that their blood sugar is high and tell them, hey, your blood sugar is high, let's do the necessary, you know. So basically, secondary prevention would be early detecting that diabetes mellitus. Now, we talk about uh, tertiary prevention, which is in a case of someone who is actually already sick, preventing complications and better treating that patient. In, in other words, essentially enhancing their life, you know, their, their lifestyle, making them uh, uh, able to live closer to a normal lifestyle. This, unfortunately, was the case for 53-year-old Martin Sampson. Immediately after he was diagnosed with kidney failure, doctors predicted that he would have died within 24 hours. But six years later, Sampson remains a regular patient at the Victoria Hospital, where he receives dialysis three times per week. It was about, I used to work with my uncle at Mid San Mo, in town, by the market. I, first thing I so far, I feel like my, I realized my legs, my both legs was swelled. And anything I've, I eat, I've been vomiting. I was feeling strange. So my uncle took me to see a private doctor. When I went there, which is Lambert Nelson, when I went there, they told me that um, um, I have to go and take a test stop here. That was the following day. That was the following day I had to go and take a test stop here. So I go back to the business. Whilst I go back to the business and work, I collapse. I couldn't see nothing. I couldn't see not a thing. I just don't feel like that. When I reach at the hospital, they send me tap here. And have a, a a test, a kidney test, like this. So I went. When I come back, they told me both of my kidney failed. They couldn't have, they didn't have no space for me on the chair. So the doctor tell me there is nothing they can do for me. 
Dr. Matthew says there are hundreds of stories like Samson's every day. It is sad that the patients have to be turned down because of a poor health care system, which is now compounded by the imposition of VAT on pharmaceuticals. He called my, my child mother, which is right now is my wife. They called my wife and they told my wife, come and, have, come and spend some time with your husband. We're discharging your husband. He remained 24 hours, 24 hours to leave. So they come, they told me the list, they show me a list, they told me that I have no chair there for me, all the chair fill out, so they can't do nothing for me. But my aunt told my uncle, send me tapion, which is on spend about two months, and to see if they will get a space for me. UWB was in power. The former Prime Minister, Mr. Citizen King, I had to call the hospital and ask the hospital, please look for a space for this man, try and help this man. Try and help this man for me. Which is, which is, they do, whilst I there, they come, they told me somebody just passed away at the hospital, which is, they're taking dialysis, so they'll fit me in. Samson would later stay at the Tapion Hospital where he received immediate treatment. The same man tried to get married, I fell sick, you know, and which is, I still, as I tell my, as I tell my girlfriend, which is, he was my, um, um, my child mother at the same time, but we didn't get married as yet, but which is, I explained, the doctor explained to her what his kidney problem before getting married, so she say, I love my man, I'm gonna marry my man, and we get married. And after, you know, I get the dialysis, I start, you know, coming good, everything, you know. But um, um, with the dialysis, it's not easy. It's very expensive. It's very expensive, which is, we pay in every term, every month, is a thousand nine hundred and change. But with the medication, the reason why I cannot buy medication now, because of the VAT. In terms of tertiary prevention, we're actually depending solely on the medications. The medications are what's going to keep the blood pressures down, what's going to keep the blood sugars down, and therefore prevent the complications of these chronic non-communicable diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure. If the patients in any way are finding it more difficult to afford their medications, then it means either they may not take it every day as they should or they may not take it at all or they may decide that because the medication is is not as affordable as before that they're totally discouraged about uh, you know medicines prescribed by doctors altogether and they may start to uh, decide that they're going to do their own thing it takes me back to um, the whole philosophy we had behind the universal health care because what we are saying is that if if you keep people well and you keep people out of hospital. So if you prevent strokes, if you prevent heart attacks, if you prevent the, the hospitalizations of, of people, um, you actually um, reduce health expenditure. Not only, not only that, if, if you consider medicines that actually make people more productive, if people don't die, so that they have more life years to be productive. If people have a quality, um, they can, their diseases are so managed, such that take something like arthritis, if it's under decent control and management, then the people are more mobile and more productive. So that in itself is an economic benefit. And the rationale behind um, medications like, like those, that deal with the chronic diseases and deal with actually life um, saving or life threatening illnesses, the, is that it is in the government's interest to invest in the prevention of hospitalizations, the prevention of death, the um, prevention of people having to come out of work, the prevention of them losing their legs, losing their, losing their sight, losing um, things like kidney function, going on to dialysis. These are all expensive consequences of people who don't manage their, their, their chronic illnesses um, um, well. We pay in a thousand nine hundred and change every month and plus the medication one side 
is about $200 or $300 for, for two weeks supply, right? But um, um, from the time they put the vat and the, um, and the medication, it's very expensive. A lot, of, a lot of us don't take medication for past two months or three months because we cannot afford to pay it. That's why we, it kind of be rough by us sometimes. You know? Sometimes I have to go out there and look for help. Pass all around and look for help. You know, try to try and buy my medication. Even Yadi, Jaim, all them fellas, them fellas in the radio station support me. I go to the station already. They have a lady in the market calling Sasho. Sasho is the one you know, I drop a form there, he's the one checking for me. Everybody might the market by checking for me because they know me very good. You know, they check in for me, everything. The struggling father of two says it's very difficult to find a job. This, he adds, has created many problems for his family, including the inability to support his teenage son with school expenses and his wife. Once, because I go into all different companies and look for a job, and on the form and the application they will give you to interview. They'll ask you if you have any sickness. But I won't lie for them to tell them I don't have a sickness. Because I don't buy my sickness. I get my sickness. You understand? Everybody getting sickness. Everybody getting sick. But I go to him, you know. He told me certain things. Like when he give me the application to fill. So I myself write. I am on dialysis. I take in dialysis three times a week. I take in dialysis Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's three, three, three days a week. So which is, I say if I get, I take in, my shift is in the morning, morning shift. I mean from the, if you start working with somebody, the person will want a day work, I can take last shift, which is between three to, between three thirty to four o'clock. I can take my last shift, you know, understand what I mean? So I tell him if you can help me, which is with a driving job because I understand you had need a driving. I have my license, I drive in. So you know, like to, to do sales, I thought you would uh, give me a little job because I could, he told me, he'll call me. And he never called me, you understand? He never called me. So if I was getting a job to help me and to help my family, I would, uh, I would, uh, do, do, do a little, um, little more for myself, pay my medication, everything so. Just last year, his now 17-year-old son was forced to drop out of secondary school because of his father's inability to pay for his final CXC exam. 17-year-old Neil Sampson had to make the ultimate choice of allowing his father to use up monies for dialysis rather than pay for his CXC exam. Well, I went to Quorum Secondary, I dropped out in Form 5. Yeah. Right now, I'm just about to start working and some other things that I'm working on. As sad as it may sound, this is the harsh reality that many St. Lucians must face. A broken home, sacrifices from every member of the family, including children in this example. Dr. Matthew says, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Let's put a scenario where one of these patients actually ends up developing a stroke because they did not use their medication properly. The complications of having a stroke might include bed sores, might include infections or sepsis secondary to bed sores, might include pneumonias, might include multiple hospitalizations, might include further complications from other conditions which are not related at all, might include family members needing to leave their jobs to actually be at home with these patients you know to take care of them might include other healthcare professionals needing to go to that patient's home can you imagine in a month how much that patient might end up spending in other words we're talking about a patient spending thousands of dollars per month as compared to 30 dollars if they had used their medication properly so you know we say and we emphasize prevention is cheaper than cure. And the first world countries, uh, countries which are more developed, have actually placed more emphasis on making medications affordable, 
on making preventative measures more affordable, whether it be in making food, healthy foods cheaper, in making uh, exercise machines cheaper, in making doctor's visits and uh, health services more available so that people could get their pressures checked, and ultimately in making it easier for people to get their medications, people with chronic conditions to get their medications and use it properly. It definitely ends up being a lot less of a burden uh, to the government, which ends up, if a patient does end up suffering from a complication, ends up having to deal with that patient if they cannot afford it, the burden ends up on the government, we say no. St. Lucia is not the only Caribbean island that has not exempted pharmaceuticals from that. Many other countries have had their share of problems. However, Trinidad and Tobago, realizing there was a lot more danger in charging that on medication, removed it completely. It's been off for a while now and now we have a program and most of our medication through a program called CDAP, most of our medication is free. So it's not really vatable now. But most of all, it was it with the change of the government it came about, so probably because of the pressure and stuff. St. Lucians who heard about the successful removal of VAT on pharmaceuticals in Trinidad and Tobago are now desperately calling on the government to remove the VAT charge on medication. I think they should take out the VAT on the medication because the thing is that, been, again, mostly poor people that only that have the, um, the, the diabetes, the blood pressure and all this kind of, and monthly they have to go and get this medication. I mean, some of them not working, some of them is depending on their, on their children and others, you know, and different things like that. So when you do put fat on them, that's draining the a strain on, the, on their children, you understand? So I find they should have, um, you know, just put it a certain level, especially things you get in every, you have to go and get every month. It's compulsory because the sugar diabetes, the blood pressure and all these kind of things, you know? So you have to get it it's a compulsory thing because nowadays people don't believe in hope, they don't believe in, 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 in you know, go and take a little and prick it and you know, it's going to give you a thing. So they have to go to the drug, so they should already take out the vat on it. It has an impact because I'm feeling the impact because I'm what you call diabetic, hypertensive, and I'm out of work, I'm an old age. So at all costs, something must be done about that, removing that from medication. There's a claim that there was a 15% before VAT on medication, but nobody spoke about it unless VAT came. Right now, you know, we have a lot of people that are grown people and they're not able to buy the medicines, so they should definitely get the VAT of the medicine so that it could be cheaper for the people, you know? Because otherwise, I mean, we're squeezing, I mean, most of the people cannot afford it, right? Some come, but a lot of people cannot afford it, so they should definitely get it out. Well, the main thing I see the people should definitely come up, you know, at least, you know, get together, I'm, uh, probably do a little, um, uh, a little match or whatever, you know, just to make the government see definitely, well, that need to, you know, to get out, right? The VAT business need to get out. Because if they don't do that, I mean, you know, the, people, the government might think it's some kind of joke thing that's going on, you know, but it's a strain on the people, right? It is. Well, I feel they should remove VAT on medication because we have so many elderly people in St. Lucia that's not working. And especially when they go to the health centre, you will get one medication at the health centre, and they're sending you and buy the other one at the drugstore. I feel they should remove it. So the especially people that are suffering diabetes and pressure, they should be able to get their medication free. Pathologist Dr. Stephen King explains that if the VAT charge is not removed on pharmaceuticals, St. Lucia may see an increase in its death rate over the next few years. In my particular um, practice and in terms of autopsies, I'm seeing people who said, Yes, I see, I see a lot of the burden of, of chronic disease and I only see a, a little bit of the tip of it because many people will not come, many people with chronic disease don't end up coming to the autopsy table because they get their death certificates from the doctors. But many do come and many people come for other reasons and they have chronic disease and you can see the impact of chronic disease on their bodies. And yes, you're right. I mean, I see lots of stroke, lots of, lots of kidney disease. Lots of lots of heart failure, lots of heart attack, but you know, lots lots of, of, of conditions that um, that show that we are not tackling our chronic diseases in the manner which we should. So now it's not just about providing pharmaceuticals, because pharmaceuticals is one component of managing chronic diseases. An important one, but one. And what we need to do, and again, this is this is why to me the VAT debate or discussion 
again allows us maybe to focus on what is the kind of regime we should have to manage disease in the country. What are the kinds of information systems we have? What are the what what are the kinds of protocols, standards of care that we have that we are monitoring to make sure that um, we are doing the best, we have the best medicine applied in the best manner. Um, for, for, the, for the patient and we are ensuring that the patient is in full compliance and we, understand, we are dealing with the issues of, of the lab testing or the, or the other types of testing that may be necessary to ensure the health of people. There, so there are other components in managing chronic disease. Samson, whose life eventually left him, says when he thought things just couldn't get worse, the unimaginable happened. I come from Antic, uh, when I come from Antic, my allies, so whilst I'm in the, uh, in the, in the unit, the, my doctor called me, she tell me after dialysis she want to see me, she want to talk to me about my result, my blood result. But when I go to the doctor, she told me my blood, my blood low, a little bit low. So I need to take my medication for my blood. So I told him, doc, you know, things rough by me these days, I cannot afford yet as yet. You know, to buy my medication, you know. So you tell me I need it. You need to take it because if you don't take it, you'll 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 collapse. And it's the same day she tell me that I went up I think about a three hours rest and I had to go and collect my son at the school in town, my five year old five year year old boy. So when I went and take him, before school over a friend of mine called me, he want, he want to see me, so I went and see the friend while I there. I feel my, my whole body changed, but I know what happened to me, but as I take the rest, so I think. So I go to a shop, which is the other big, a big fan there, so I was taking some fan, some, some a little air from the fan. I come there, I tell the lady, can I take some air from you? So he tell me, go ahead, while I there. I feel myself hot and I collapse right in front of the people shop. They wake me up and they put me to sit, sat down. I collapse again. So they wake me up again, they put me to sit down and the lady asks me if to call the ambulance. So I tell the lady, yes, go ahead, call the ambulance. Within moments, the ambulance arrived at the scene. Samson's sister, who was not too far away, was also summoned to the scene. Knowing that he had no money to pay for medical services, Samson initially refused to be taken back to the Victoria Hospital. Eventually, his sister convinced him, and he was on his way. When I reached the hospital, they put me on a wheelchair, I went inside. I am feeling myself good. The nurse telling me, look the paper, go by the counter, and pay twenty dollars. So I tell the nurse, I cannot go by the counter, and I don't have no money on me. I cannot go by the counter. I feel myself good. So the man from the ambulance telling me, that's the that's the law. Hey, I tell the man in the ambulance, I'm a patient at the Victoria Hospital. You understand? So I cannot go. Let me rest first before I go and take. He tell me, nah. Now they will need the wheelchair. I cannot stay there. I have to go outside where the people are sitting for me to for me to if I go and sit down there, go and rest myself there. So I take the paper from the doctor, but I couldn't go to the counter and pay twenty dollars because I didn't have twenty dollars. But the nurse still tell me go and take. But I say I cannot do it. I don't have I don't have nobody there to go and do this thing for me. So I went. I sit in front of the people to see. If I can rest myself after I feel good, then I'll go and go and tell the people by the cashier, I have $20. I'm a patient there, I come and see. So I sit down there. When I sit down there, I still feel. I, f I fall in. I feel I feel in myself good. So I tell one of the people that they call the nurse for me. When the nurse, when they, when they go and call the nurse for me, the nurse stand up behind the glass behind the counter is, and you're watching who's, who's the patient that, that, um, that, that feels sick. But I'm watching the nurse, but my head, my head going already, I feeling giddy. I seen like, it's, I seen one nurse, but I seen six nurses, like, like I'm not there. So when I see nobody attending to me, nobody, so I start screaming. 
and I pushed my head straight to the glass. But I tossed was broken glass, which is, I say, I don't care, I just live in my life, I just doing what I have to do. But it's my car, that's why it didn't break. So I start beating it, I beating it. When I realize I'll fall because I need to rest. When I realize I fall, I go outside. By the security little house, I lie down on the piece of wall. When I lie down on the piece of wall, about five security, four to five security come to me and say, who was knocking the glass there? You that was doing? I say, yes, I'm the one that was knocking the glass. But I'm not feeling good, I'm sick. They give me a paper and I can't. One of the security take the paper and bring it to the counter and bring it back for me. That's, the, that's why they bring, bring me inside and then they put me to rest until I live there after three in the morning. One factor that we definitely recognize as having potential to land someone in, in bankruptcy is a health issue, a serious health issue. Whether it be a chronic communicable disease with complications or it might actually be a, a chronic disease like cancer which is not uh, successfully treated. In any case like that, it means that that patient who initially would need to use their funds to, to take care of their, their health expenses finds themselves uh, outdone by the, the, the expenses of the health care. Their family needs to assume the expense of the health care. When the family cannot afford, in many cases, government ends up needing to assume the cost of their health care because somebody has to take care of them. You know, so we say that there is definitely a domino effect which ends up landing in the hands or on, on the laps of government. You know, it, it ends up being their responsibility to, uh, to, to handle. Samson, who eventually was seen by a medical doctor, says he felt like all hope was lost at that moment. The only option, he emotionally added, was to give up. I come to the hospital, I don't, have, I don't have no money on me, I mean, I don't have no money on me. I, you, you can just put me to lie down, just give me a rest, and after when I, when I feel myself good, I'll go to the counter. Or when my sister come up, I, my sister would just go to the counter and, and pay the 20 or tell the people what's going on, you understand? And then they die at the hospital, because I commit, I say there's glass that day, I don't care what happened, happened. I just push my head in it, if it breaks, it can, it can cut my neck, you understand, because I give up. I give up at the hospital. I give up and they are checking, they send in security, about four to five security behind me. You understand? And I lie down, they say I lie down by the security, by the door. Even one of my nurse at the same time come and say, hey, Mr. Samson, what happened to you? I say, nurse, I have to myself good. And I come in there and check. The nurse right away, go and check on the doctor inside. And then they, they take me inside, they, they bring me inside and put me to rest. I left there after three. Samson's cry is just one of thousands who have been adversely affected since the implementation of VAT. Cognizant of the domino effect associated with the introduction of VAT, the United Workers' Party has persistently called on the government of St. Lucia to not only reduce the VAT rate, but to completely remove the application of VAT on pharmaceuticals. As you know, Sir John, in his budget speech of 2007, clearly indicated the United Workers' Party intended to introduce that. Um, but as time went by and things started to make themselves more apparent, the first being the recession, um, that was then followed by Hurricane Thomas um, with a continuation of, of the recession that clearly United Workers' Party at no time had implemented that. That's the fact. Um, and even in our campaign promise, we indicated that the intention was for the government to introduce that, but only under the condition that the economic environment and social environment was conducive in our minds to be able to do so. Um, so there had been several discussions in terms of the level of the VAT, whether it should be 7.5%, 8%, 15%. There was a lot of debate. There was debate in whether the VAT should only be on goods. Um, and not on services because in fact VAT on services was an entirely new tax and a lot of the small businesses it really became a form of income tax because they, they're, they're having to pay it um, and in essence VAT of 15% is higher than even a corporate tax of, of 20% so um, we were very weary of introducing some of VAT at those levels 
um, particularly given what the business environment was. In 2012, after the government of Trinidad and Tobago realized that the VAT had created a domino effect, causing food prices to rise at an alarming rate, so too did the cost of pharmaceuticals and ultimately the cost of living. The government decided to zero rate over 4,000 items at the supermarket and to completely remove VAT on pharmaceuticals. It's very clear um, that government ignored the advice given by a lot of different people um, with regards to VAT. That clearly introducing VAT of 15% um, on goods and services as well as services um, was a mistake. And I think that we're now seeing that that advice was well-founded in terms of the, re the deepening of the recession that happened. You know, it's interesting to note that while all the other islands were immediately fall of, of feeling the consequence of the, of the financial meltdown in 2009, St. Lucia weathered the storm. I mean, all throughout 2010, 2011, remained in positive economic growth rates while everybody else was, was in negative growth rates. Now, with the introduction of that, um, we've now seen a further deterioration of the economy in the country. Um, from collecting taxes, whereas the government has probably achieved or overachieved its expectation in the revenue from VAT itself, but other revenues, um, duties, corporate taxes, personal income taxes, have all underachieved. Um, but more importantly, I think that they are, have weakened the economy quite substantially. So the potential for any major growth has really been diminished quite considerably by this decision to introduce VAT at this particular time. And what VAT has done, it is basically reduced the amount of disposable income that people have had. Um, and then it's further exasperated this, this situation by people now losing jobs. We've had over 3,900 jobs that have been lost in two years. Um, and remember, Solution does not have a social net. So a person going on unemployment literally is left to fend for themselves medical care, um, education, transportation, no more subsidies on foods. Um, so the, 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 the toll on individuals is really, you know, inhumane, if one was to describe it at this particular juncture. The truth is, if you don't, if you remove the VAT from the medicine, the VAT will be 15%, essentially 15% cheaper. Because if you say, and that's being simplistic, but if, if something it costs $10 and you put 15% on it, it's 15% more expensive. So it's now going to cost $11.50. If you, if you don't put the 15%, it's $10. So the point is the VAT, whichever way you cut it, the VAT will make medicine more expensive. Nobody can tell us that, that adding a tax onto the medicines will, will not make them more expensive. Government in the public sector has also said that they will absorb the VAT so that, in other words, there's no change from prior to VAT to um, now in the, in the public pharmacies. And that's okay. But the point is, many people have to access medicines or choose to access medicines sometimes in the private sector. And there are a number of reasons for doing that. One, sometimes the medicines are not available in the public sector. Secondly, sometimes the, the private sector is more convenient for people so that the times, the locations, um, they make, so they make, that's all part of being accessible. Now, in our country, we tend to have a very, um, uh, a, 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 almost a, a strained relationship between the public and the private sector. I often wonder why, because in real, in, in real terms, there's nothing wrong with us investigating new regimes of how we manage um, the access to, to health services and for that matter the pharmaceuticals in this particular instance. Instance. Why can't we um, make um, private pharmacies part of our of our distribution system? In other words, why can't government have agreements with private pharmacies to 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 so that there's more access to the public? And for that matter, in these agreements you could detail exactly what pharmacies could charge for those medicines that are part of that agreement. So when we talk about um, the private sector exploiting uh, the public in terms of 
if they got cheaper medicines, they would make a higher profit. But all that can be covered in agreements with, with, with private pharmacies. And when we were first um, um, designing the universal healthcare, we actually were, were looking at doing it with private pharmacies, not just in the, not just in the public sector. Because we appreciated that, that the private pharmacies have a major role to play in the, in the health service. In fact, we were estimating that at least, or up to at least 50% of people were accessing their, 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 their pharmaceuticals in the private sector. And, these, and why should, if that's what the people want to do, why don't we find a way to facilitate the process so that there's a win-win for everybody, win for the patient, win for the government, and win for the private pharmacies? There is no reason why we could not design a system like that. People's disposable income, people's income, has been reduced dramatically in the sense not only in terms of the, the increase in cost of living of goods, but also the fact that um, they've either been seen a reduced income and other costs have gone up. So cost uh, for fuel has gone up, cost for um, rice flour and sugar has gone up, cost for electricity has gone up, cost for water has gone up. There's a fear that the cost of buses um, uh, are going to go up. Um, so overall it means that people have had substantially less money to spend than they've had traditionally. And what this has done has forced them to make some very difficult situation, decisions. So when it comes to your basic needs, basic food items, um, sending my kids to school, one affording tuition and two being able to give my child money to be able to buy lunch, transportation, um, in terms of medicine, and I think that that's really where the VAT on medicine has hurt the most, is that all of a sudden when you have felt uh, increases on all these other core items, the last straw really is VAT on medicine. You know, and this is going to have major implications for um, the health of our country moving forward, but again, can be classified as one of those totally inhumane aspects of it. I'm not telling you that reducing VAT on medicine is going to solve the problem, but at least it helps people make some better decisions. Right now, we know of examples, people are coming in and telling you that I had to make a choice between taking my medicine or sending my child to school. Um, I had to make a decision between medicine and putting food on our plate. And it's not even to say an elaborate menu. You know, when you're talking about basic things like rice and bread have gone up, which were made up the staple of a lot of people's meals. Um, this is very um, heartbreaking. Um, it's incredibly insensitive at this particular juncture. A number of concerned citizens were not afraid to express how they felt about that and its impact, stating that the current government was callous and inconsiderate after seeing the negative impact of that on the country, particularly the poor and elderly. Government should not only consider, but double consider the situation because it is really hard in solution right now, particularly on persons who are poor and persons who are not able to make it. And the VAT that is placed on medication is adding a further burden on an already difficult situation. For example, I am not too well and uh, I have to be buying medication from time to time. And believe you, I have to be paying through my nose sometimes to be able to purchase the medication that is vitally necessary. If government does that, I'm sure that they will be giving help to a lot of persons who are struggling. And it is, it, it is really something that is difficult because don't forget the health of a nation is the wealth of a nation. From the time the government put that vat, I seen my my side of dialysis, my chief, about two person, about three person die already. And that same bad thing, that medication, they cannot afford. They cannot afford. It's not me alone squeezing. Everybody crying. Everybody in the dialysis patient crying because of the VAT too high. They come in. They cannot afford to buy the medication. Like when you send when the guy they work, go to the um, um, pharmacies and buy the medication, it sometimes is missing 25 cents. You cannot get it. You understand? The VAT we, we cannot we we cannot we in dialysis patient.
cannot afford the VAT. If government could have just take out the VAT for us, that would be better. From the time they put the, the VAT, about three, two of, three or four patients die in our section. Because I take in morning shift, I take in, um, which is more than already, which is, I take in Monday shift. Monday shift. So what's about Tuesday shift? What's about Wednesday shift? I take in Wednesday shift. What's about Thursday shift? Everybody crying. Political leader of the main opposition, United Workers' Party, Alan Chosny, says, upon election into office, should the UWP win the next general elections, the first order of business is to reduce the percentage of VAT from its current 15%. Further to a reduction, he added, the UWP would also remove the VAT charge on pharmaceuticals as well as review the number of items that are zero rated and exempted. The difficulties that we're experiencing in the country right now need a major rehaul. The policy programs of the government to increase the VAT, increase the levels of taxation, and decrease the amount of subsidies, the combination of that has squeezed out the middle class has hurt small businesses and has had a dramatic effect on the poor of this country. And we need a fundamental rehaul of the strategy that's being implemented right now. The sad part is that the government has squandered two years and millions of dollars. And what's going to face us now is a situation in which the fiscal deficit has grown and the capacity of government by itself to solve these problems isn't there. So unfortunately, what has taken place in Barbados recently, in which they've had to lay off 3,000 civil servants, if that happens in St. Lucia, what it means is that more people are going to be facing what the poor have already been facing. And we will keep campaigning, lobbying, agitating as an opposition to ensure that better policies are implemented, greater sensitivity is, is targeted to the poor and more vulnerable people of our society, and that we can regain the confidence of small businesses in this country. The current SLP administration has insisted, since the implementation of VAT, that medicines are not as expensive as they were before VAT was introduced in October 2012. Instead, government officials continue to defend the VAT charge by stating that discrepancies in the pricing will iron themselves out. The administration led by Dr. Kenny D. Anthony has held steadfast despite hearing the calls from citizens, the medical fraternity and private sector for the removal of VAT on medicines. Will the government finally listen to the plight of the people and provide a reprieve? Even as many St. Lucians still hope that better days will finally come, Many more are almost certain that this hope is quickly fading away, a result of experiencing the most difficult era in St. Lucia's history.